welcome everyone to the Biennial of the Moving Image, another day of activities. This morning, we have the second part of the audiovisual preservation cases coordinated by Leandro Listorti. We want to connect and want to tell you also that the BIM introduced a choral online project where over 70 artists are working. It's called Look at Each Other in the Eyes. Going back to, you can find the project on the BIM's website, beam.com.ar, and face that huge meeting of productions made by over 70 artists in the times of the pandemic in this very special 2020, starting with an online surfing organized around four axes that allows us to rethink the ways in which a film festival is exhibited so everybody is invited to visit the website and specifically regarding the activity today the biennial with the support of the french embassy and of the Goethe institute organized this preservation meeting in which we are interested in looking into the problems that are related to audiovisual works, how they are looked after and preserved through different projects that maybe allow us to think about preservation today. So Leandro Listorti is coordinating the preservation roundtable. So I will now give the floor to him so he can present the activity today. Thank you very much, Leandro. Thank you, Ari. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to the BIM for coordinating this table. This is the second of the table. Today, it's focused in archives and preservation of film material. We have Paula Felix Didier today and Mark Ruff. Thank you both for being here. If you think it's okay, I will read your short bios so that people know who you are. And then I will give the floor to Paula and probably we'll have 30, 40 minutes of her presentation. And then if you have questions, you can write them on the chat. And then we will hear from Marcus and then we will have room for questions and answers. So I will read your short bios. Paula Felix Didier he is a historian from the University of Buenos Aires, a master in preservation and audiovisual media uh, from NYU. And she's currently studying a PhD in the Detail University. She's a specialist in preservation and audiovisual archives. She is currently the director of the Film Museum of the City of Buenos Aires. Markus Ruf, who was born in Stuttgart, Germany. He studied media design, experimental media design in the University of the Arts of Berlin and direction, uh, film direction in Germany. He works from in the Arsenal Institute of Image as a responsible for the audiovisual preservation projects. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to Paula. All right, well, thank you everyone for your invitation for the to the BEAM in particular, Gabriela Gordler, Andres de Negri, and Leandro and Ariel. I will now share, and let's see how this works, what I'm going to tell you today. Give me one second. There we go. Well, my lecture today, when I was talking with Leandro, thinking about which could be a topic that we could discuss here. As Leandro said, 
I studied the master's degree in archive and preservation for audiovisual media. It's called MIAP in the NYU. And my thesis was about preservation of experimental films. And in my thesis, I analyzed three specific cases. One is the one I'm going to talk about today. And then at the time, we were also working on the restoration. I thought, I think it was DVD, uh, Stan Brackage's films and one of the installations of Paul Jarrett's. I chose this one specifically because it's one of the ones I worked with very closely because the restorer preserver was Bill Brandt, who was at the time my professor on film preservation. Even though this is not a new work, I chose this because I believe that it helps us think about many of the issues that have to do with the preservation of the experimental film. I apologize, but the concept of experimental film, and actually one of the chapters of my thesis that I will not talk about today has to do with the naming, how to call these films, because there are many ways of calling them, a lot of disagreements, some agreement, Nowadays, uh, we could say how to preserve the heteronormative film is not necessarily experimental film or uh, avant-garde film. These are ways of making films that are, escape the norm somehow. Oh, okay. I don't see the quotations. I tried twice with the PowerPoint, but I don't know why you can't see it, unfortunately. So I'm going to read it from Oh, what a pity, because it's a nice quotation. I don't know why it doesn't show up in the PowerPoint. I copied it, I pasted it again. I will read it very quickly. It's a quotation from Stan Brackage and that, that gives it, this matters a framework in connection to experimental film. This was published, an interview that he had with Jonas Mekes and Brackage said, spitting deliberately on the lens or completely ruining their focal intentions, one can accomplish certain levels of impressionism. We can also hold the camera in a special way and to disaggregate small worlds. We can overexpose the film or we can underexpose the films. We can use fog filters, rain filters, and balance light filters. We can use neon lights with neurotic color temperatures. We can use glasses that were never thought for a camera, or we can even use some kind of glass that was thought for a camera, but used against its specifications. We can go out in the night shooting with day film or vice versa, or you can turn yourself into a vice versa and be the supreme wizard with a lot of hats full of rabbits that reproduce like crazy. For me, this quotation that started this paper, well, it was referring to what are the ethical and technical dif challenges that uh, experimental food preservation has. And I also like this other quotation that comes from painting as well. And it also represents the paradox of the work of preservation and restoration in, in particular. But in the case of avant-garde experimental film, very specifically, there are two ways for a, film, uh, for a painting to disappear. One is to restore it, and the other one is not to restore it. And then you can see some of the issues, the general issues that have to do with working with such a peculiar material. In that regard, 
who work, those of us who work in audiovisual preservation are always thinking and developing with certain ingenuity different ways of work. In this specific case, each work, each film requires a set of solutions or a set of strategies that are specific and valid only, only for that work. And that is what turns it so uh, labor intensive. And here, John Gantenberg, who besides being a distributor and an artist in experimental film and experimental audiovisual in different formats, digital and film formats, he developed in the 90s or late 90s a program to rescue films or works of artists that have passed away due to HIV. So he created a community that collected, gathered, and restored or rescued different artists' work, especially the New York avant-garde that had died due to HIV. So Gartenberg developed this kind of guidelines, I don't know how to call it, these are kind of advices. What is the best way to work when you face these type of films? And this, I think, is really good because it were, talks about something in which I truly believe that we develop and work within the museum constantly. Someone might uh, join me in this. And so someone who works in archives and preservation of audiovisual materials necessarily has to know very various disciplines. Maybe each of us is a specialist in one, but you can never leave the other disciplines out. So the first one is to know the history of the genre, of the medium, of the technology, of the aesthetics, of the narrative, of the work of the artist that we are working with that is fundamental and i think that this is not always the case in my case i am originally a historian so i'm always pushing on the side of history but not everyone does this the second one is to build a cooperation network like in any preservation work in the visual field it's fundamental to have the artist when he or she is available of course or some of the technicians that worked in this work, the archive man or woman, the preserver and the technicians of the lab, they have to work in a collaboration back and forth uh, for the decision making. Here I have inclusive language. So focus in the creative process of the artist. Fundamentally, because this means getting to know the process in this case uh, that we're talking about, it was very important. Also to document which version you will preserve, because we also know that in preservation, the w work that we do when we restore and we preserve a work, it always implies making decisions that sometimes we don't even know if they are, I don't know if the word is correct, but we have worked and researched, I don't know if you have incorrect decisions, but you have decisions that forcibly you have to make. And sometimes strand away from the original, we have to also agree on which is the original. And those decisions have to be taken consistently and also you have to document in writing everything you have done because as you well know technology moves forward the possibilities move forward preservation theories move forward ideas also move forwards and now the platforms for the diffusion of our work move forward so we know that in order to be respectful of the creative process and the work of the artist 
and to translate this to the new platforms, digital platforms or new possibilities of access that we have. There is a previous work regarding color, regarding textures. This cannot be translated literally when you digitize the work. So all the decisions that you make along this path is important to document them. Maybe farther down the road, you have a different options, different ways to migrate this work. And you have to know which is the way, the path that you have taken, which ones can be undone and which ones cannot. And well, that's it. In that regard, is that the technical issues cross the ethical ones. So I think these six guidelines are a good summary of a path to follow when you face a preservation and restoration work. So in this case, the film is called Horizons, is the first part of Selective Affinities by Larry Gottheim. Larry Gottheim was one of the most important representatives of the landscape films in the field of experimental films in the US. Actually, he started and he wanted to be a poet and a writer. He studied comparative literature in university and he moved towards films and experimental films as a professor in the university where he taught in New York. They created a film department, which was mythic. It's called the State University of New York and it's one of the great factories that worked in this field. Here we have a photo with, uh, to his left, Karen Schneeman and Darren Child, both of them next to Larry Gottheim, each on one side. The preservation work and the case that I want to mention today was developed by Bill Brand and his company. This is a very old logo and even the address doesn't exist and it hasn't existed for years, but this is the logo that he had at the time. BB Optics is his preservation and video company. That bill is these three things and this horrible, horrible slide was used in my thesis. And I repeat this now because he wears different hats because he's a professor, an artist and a preservator at the same time. And I think that is important for the reasons I mentioned before, Preserva visual preservation works need this connection and in this case, this all happens in the same person. He was already a renowned artist when he started working in preservation. And that turned him quickly into a specialist of preservation of experimental film, basically. And as many others started, he tried to preserve his own films and those of his friends. In the case of Bill, his friends were Boris Brighton, Larry Cockham, and many of these figures that are part of the epitome of experimental film from the US. This is Bill teaching. He taught in his, he teaches in his own home where he has his workshop and where students used to work with him in the project that he was involved in at the time. So the year that I studied with him, we worked with Horizon by Laura Gottheim. This is kind of confidential. These are the documents and the history of the preservation of the film. This is to highlight the relevance of having a written document of all the decisions you make. And in this case, we have here a fragment. It's a draft, as it 
well says up there, it's a draft of the history of preservation of horizons. All of this is may, may be distant for us because the work that we do here in Argentina or that we are able to do here in Argentina usually requires a lot of more of creativity and ingenuity because maybe when you have opportunities for preservation in other countries, it's uh, different. Here, I included this image because I wanted to mention how it was that, or who financed this project. So, the project was financed, or BB Optics was hired by the Nell Media Center of the New York Public Library, and the Public Library of New York has a specialized center for the collection of audiovisual media, which is called the Donald Media Center. They submitted a project to the grant, a grant that someone developed in the US, which was the first grant, the first financing for the preservation and restoration of experimental film. I understand that it was the first in the world and that was organized and financed by the Film Foundation, which is, is not Martin Scorsese's foundation, but he founded it, and which in general lines, it worries about financing the restoration of films around the world, because we have the World Film Foundation accompanying the Film Foundation. They have a large program for the restoration and rescuing of African film. They worked with us with the Film Museum in the restoration of Prisoners of the Earth in 2019. And in the US, it's financing this grant for experimental films, accompanied by the program that the US has to subsidize restoration works, which is the National Film Preservation Foundation, which also gives out money every year for, these are, you know, grants. You have to submit a project and there is a competition. And in this case, they presented different works by Larry Gottheim. Horizons, as you might well know, if you, can, if you haven't seen the film, you can see it online is a film that he shot or worked with throughout the four seasons. He shot throughout two years the effects of uh, time and climate and the four seasons on the landscape. It's called Horizons because all of the shots that were he used uh, work with a, an incredible precision. They have precisely Horizons and that is the plan that he worked with. All the images should have shots of horizons and a certain composition. It is 77 minutes long. And finally, Gotham continued it. The film ended up being a part of a four film set, uh, and it's called, similar to Goethe's work, it's considered one of the great, one of his great works and landscape films. The film is from 1973. These cards, as Bill had for the restoration, and that show this very specific and precise work with each of the shots were supplied by Larry Gottheim himself. He was still alive at the time. He was involved in the restoration of the film. And the editing that Larry Gottheim did 
was highly influenced by different issues. I, it's very complex. I don't want to go deeply into this matter. Maybe we can talk about this in a different occasion. But basically, he was inspired in Virgilio's Georgicas and the Four Seasons by Vivaldi and mainly the Divine Comedy by Dante. To take from Dante the rhyme that Terza Rima is called in the Divine Comedy, and he decided that his film would work with the rhythm connected to this kind of rhyme that Dante used. The months and months of shooting and the hundreds and hundreds of shots that that he had this specific composition regarding where the horizon would be placed, the colors were related. He would organize it in a non-chronological way. The four seasons are as if the shots were shot in order, but the final result is not like this. The internal structure obeys to this specific work that he made with this issue of rhyme. Let's see now. I'm also going to read a quotation, but first here you can see the issue of how the shots are finding their own rhythm in connection to these ideas that guided the subsequent editing work. It, this was not present at the time of shooting. These are ideas that came up when he was editing the film. Bill, and I'm going to read part of the history of pres this preservation, he said that this specific work of preservation presented a certain number of challenges, very special, and partly due to the errors and the compensation of these errors that the filmmaker had made in the initial production of the film. This was particularly interesting because this is not a project that had too big or special challenges, but this one that I'm going to tell you about and the fact that we didn't have copies of one of the roles. I'm going to tell you in a bit about that too. And so to tell you how you work in any preservation projects, what you do is to gather all the elements that you have available. Elements are the negatives, the positives, the copies, the fragments, these cards that the artists provided. If you had some material from the DOP, Maybe you can have that in the case of the experimental film. The additional difficulty that we might we usually find is that as each of these films is a unique work that has few copies or in many cases no copies, most of the material is originally worked with reversible film. This was the case of Horizons. Reversible film for maybe those of you who don't know, I hope everyone here does know, does not require negative. The reversible film is used in the camera and it's developed and that's it. You don't have an intermediate process. You do not have the mediation of the negative in, the, in between. So many times the works that are done on reversible material in eight millimeters, super eight millimeters and 16 are unique copies because you don't have a negative to make copies from. So the only way to make copies of this material is the internegative. And of course, digitalization. This, and it's also very important to point out, is not always something feasible to digitize directly. Sometimes, you need this intermediate analog step to get a good copy, to get a good internegative, to only afterwards digitize it for many reasons that have to do with deterioration, the binary system, coloration or color grading, and some other issues that are specific to each film. But 
also because digitization is not the most lasting form of preservation. Even today, in audiovisual preservation, the preservation of the original, whether it's in film or magnetic or even digital, the preservation of the original support is always a basic principle of any means of conservation, the original or in any work of art, you store the original, you keep it. In case of film, it has proven to be the one that lasts longer of all of the audiovisual formats due to different reasons. In the case of magnetic, because it's a format that has proven that it doesn't last more than two, three, four decades. And then because of its own nature, it presents preservation problems. And in the case of digital, mainly because of programmed obsolescence, there we don't have formats that without the need of the continuous application and also because of the corrosion that digital formats might experience doesn't last as long as a film that saved in the correct temperature and humidity conditions can last for 50, 60 years or more. So for this reason, the first process is the analog preservation process, and then it is digitized, sometimes to be restored and sometimes because digital is a wonderful tool for access to make all these materials accessible and uh, for those that in the case of uh, like in the case of experimental film there is only one single copy furthermore in this specific case of horizons what also came about is what they call the errors i don't know if you know but in the case of the reversible 16 millimeters films editing was work with in a specific way that forced you to work from two roles, roll A and roll B, or reel A and reel B. There was one shot in one reel, and the second reel, there was a, this, we had the same shot from roll B, but was placed a black glue, and it was like a puzzle to have reel A and reel B, and each shot in each roll intertwined so we necessarily use this black glue between shot and shot this black glue that Gottheim used for the film was defective it had some problems especially with the perforation so when you got the two copies together and you made just one we had stains where you could see the broken perforations so what Gottheim did was to paint these perforations with black ink. And in many cases, it didn't dry enough. So when they did the final work of gathering rolls, reels A and B, and sorry if it's a bit confusing, that ink leaked into the image. So this was one of the problems that we had to solve. And we did this by cleaning with a swab, with alcohol, with a lot of patience, frame by frame, and reel by reel. And here we have an ethical decisions so among the many that you have to make when you are restoring that have to do with whether if this was the condition of the original, if these errors, if we can call them errors or circumstances of the original were in the copy that the audience saw in the first place when they said for the first time, do we preserve them or do we correct them? In this case, because we had the artist with us, he was present, and this is one of the big issues in connection to this work where you have the possibility to establish a dialogue with the artist. He wanted to correct them. Many of us 
can tell you of, of many situations where the artist or the manager or the producer decided that preservation is a possibility to improve or correct those things that happen during the shooting, during the editing, or the post-production, or at the time of making the film. And this is where we have a discussion, preservers and artists, because we have this idea of restoration and to give it back the original quality, not to improve it. And digital tools nowadays, in many cases, allow us to improve things. So this is a discussion for which I have no specific answer. I think that what is interesting is to discuss this and to the negotiation between the parts. And that's why I think it's fundamental in the case of films to preserve both versions, the original one seen by the audience and this other one improved, corrected, or whatever you want to call it, that results from uh, works of preservation. And here in the document of the history of this preservation, we have the elements, the departing elements. You can see that you have the original color reversal, A and B rows, real one, real two, and part of real three. But we have real row one and row B. But the original of A and B rows for real three, well, this is an indiscretion. It's here in the document. It might not be published, Duarte the laboratory lost them. We can say it today because Duarte does not exist anymore. They lost it at the time. And this happens as is this very common everywhere. Directors, producers, and artists usually leave their material in the lab because it is more practical because in the case that you have to make a copy of the work, the film is already there. And also because the films were complicated to store because basically it took up a lot of space that required um, preservation in conditions of humidity and temperature. So it, it usually happens that they are left in the labs and sometimes the laboratories close or move or many other things can happen, or they might be lost or deteriorated. In this case, we didn't have the originals of Roll 3 or Real 3, and we had to start with that. So the things that we had were copies of Real 3, into negative, one reversible copy, and the copy that was used for the premiere of the film or the projection of the film. Here we have the narration of what I was explaining just now using this black glue that had a few problems. Gottheim had fixed it with ink and that ink caused a few problems. So the decision we made talking with Gottheim was to was that he would work and look at the copy for the premiere and look at the originals and he would make decisions where he considered that it could be improved. The final decision was to improve or to correct. This is one of the shots, I think it's 16 millimeters. In some cases, we don't have the correct range. This was part of the documentation of the restoration. And the group of students that were at the time studying the preservation with him, we assisted him to and helped him think about these issues that I mentioned to make some decisions. 
decisions that were made between Bill and Larry Gottheim, but it was very, very interesting mm -hmm. working in these discussions about how to do this. And for me, even if this is an example that I believe happened a long time ago, the film was finished in 2005. There There were a lot of screenings. It was a part of one of the Whitney Museum's biennials. It was also screened in the Coruña Festival, in numerous festivals of experimental film. There is a car alarm beeping behind me. I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear it. I hope not. I wanted to tell you all this because I think it was something foundational for me, and I say this for me, I'm sorry about the self-reference, foundational for me in terms of how to think in the visual preservations and to face materials as I said, heteronormative materials. And one thing is to work with industrial films with where you have a lot of issues that you have in connection to the direction of photography or standardized processes, even if they have a lot of difficulties and ethical difficulties when you do that. The avant-garde film, experimental film, homemade films or artist films present us with other challenges that have to do with what I said before, in the case of them, many are single copies or unique copies. They have gone through all these processes that I talked about in the beginning that go against the standard. And then you cannot use the standardized information that you know of how a film behaves. For example, Akron, because you know how to, it behaves in the when you develop the film, it has sometimes been overexposed or underexposed or you have used the uh, film to shoot at night, or the film has expired, or it has weird films of things that Brackett said that were never thought to be used as a filter. All this non-standardization of experimental and artist films force us to have to sit down and think and make decisions. And sometimes the artist is not available or anyone that has worked in the project. So those decisions are made solo. And that uh, those solitary decisions are not so solitary because you have a community of works that have been made in which you can base to support those decisions. And well, every time that you make decisions being aware, knowing the history of the medium, knowing the history of the work, and knowing in general lines what preservation implies, and you make these decisions and document them in writing, well, I think that we are getting as close as we can to uh, an archive preservation restoration work that is acceptable. I don't know, I have no idea how much time went by. If I have some time left, you are precisely on time, so we will leave the rest for the questions and answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you of, uh, all of you who are present, everyone who are helping with the technical part, everyone who invited me. You have my email if you want to ask me anything or to say something. Does anyone have a question? While you dare ask questions, I wanted to mention something that came about in the talk that we had on Wednesday that is also connected to this, that expands the issue of preservation and is it's the relevance 
you said creating a group of work, including different actors, and the relevance of the people that know the technical aspects, and they have the devices and the resources that make these films to continue living, uh, the editing machines, the cameras, and this is something that maybe sometimes uh, its importance is overlooked and it's very relevant to continue accessing these materials, the original elements. Yes, well, that's why I said that this uh, work group that is created for each preservation project in any support or format, it requires the technicians. I said the laboratory, but it's, of, yes, of course, it's the laboratory and mainly the maintenance of the devices, those who work in preservation of magnetic formats we have in the museum and laboratory. And we know that the most important thing is to gather the reproduction devices and the recording devices, the cameras and the projectors or the cassette players, and to be able to repair them. And that we don't have people that, that there's people that continues learning uh, from the technicians to support the functioning of those equipments and the preservation of knowledge, the preservation on, or conservation of knowledge, intangible knowledge, let's say, which are the technical knowledge of those people who have worked with it. Most of the technical areas of those who are working in the audiovisual field are fundamental to have this knowledge preserved. Yes. I don't know if anyone else has a question. There's one question from Lucia Menendez that refers about your comment about heteronormative materials. Well, no, it was it was something improvised or something I improvised at the time. I was uh, precisely thinking about the complexity of how to name experimental film. In this case, I'm talking about film and a certain time that called those works in the 70s, either in Argentina or in the world, they called it experimental film. But there are many other names, uh, avant-garde films, alternative, abstract films. But I think that there are many works that are not necessarily part of the experimental film field that also require a specific forms of preservation. And I improvise probably wrong this idea of heteronormativity because it's not also true that there is a norm. I talked about standardization, technical and narrative standardization of a lot of uh, narrative films, of commercial films that we are used to see in the cinemas. And there's a lot of audiovisual productions in all three supports, film, magnetic and digital, that precisely do not have anything to do with these standards and with this narrative aesthetic forms that require that we think our work from a different place. And it's not a part of my lecture today or this round table, but to think about how all these formats that came out through digital platforms is a great challenge. Nonfiction or on YouTube or Instagram Lives, installations and performances that take place on online platforms. The field of audiovisual has expanded a lot and we have to think precisely about not only the technical but ethical implications of what to preserve, who, why. I know that's also why the relevance of not only the filmmakers and producers should think about the preservation of their work, 
but also those initiatives outside institutions, if you want to call them that, of community films, of independent archives, of cooperatives or festivals or schools or workshops that are starting to work on preservation and that I think and one of the other chapter of my thesis and this is the last thing I'd say the preservation is not only the preservation of the films that are in the archives but also the distribution and exhibition, which are sometimes, or the, sometimes have been a fundamental part of the preservation of films. In the case of experimental films, if we didn't have these cooperative organizations that screened experimental film, many of these films would have been lost. So I think that in that team or in this way of thinking preservation, we have to uh, well, that's the, the word that came up, the heteronormativity just came up uh, in the moment. We have to think outside the box of traditional forms of uh, archiving, screening, preservation. I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope so. I think you did. Well, the other day, talking about the systems that in the debate after the panel, there was a... Uh, an important discussion about the role of artists and the state and the state institution in preservation and in what measure this could move forward. If you want, you can continue thinking of questions for Paula and now we will give the floor to Marcus to have a common place for questions and answers. Marcus? Yes. Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> so, um, first of all, thank you very much um, for the invitation um, to this round. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, some familiar faces. Uh, Leandro, uh, who knows uh, the institution I'm working for quite well. Um, from the time he spent at our archive, and also Paula uh, and Inge from Goethe Institute. Um, so Leandro um, asked me to present a restoration project, uh, and I hope it's fine that I'm reading, because otherwise I totally get lost uh, in this project. Maybe at the end you will know why. Anyway, I picked one title that we worked on from 2016 until early 2018. The film is called Sheo Uma by Adamu Aliu, produced in Nigeria and finished in 1976. I will talk less about the restoration process in the lab, but focus on how this project came into being, how it helped to activate or reanimate an at that point sleeping archive, and how it helped to create a foundation for a since then growing network of different archives, universities, and other institutions. With the title of this talk, um, Stumbling Upon Films, I wanted to refer to the accidental nature of this specific project and the unforeseeable impact a bunch of rusty film cans may implicate. At the same time, it is a very current phenomenon. There is an increasing number of unknown, hidden, forgotten, and or neglected film collections or film holdings, sometimes just a bunch of films or just a single film can that emerge in different places. But before getting into details, I should say a few words about Arsenal. It gives a little bit of a background uh, of our archival practice and how we got engaged in this project in Nigeria. So Arsenal uh, Institute for Film and Video Art um, was founded in 1963, uh, back then called uh, the Friends of the German Cinematique. In the name Friends of, you can make out the relation to another Berlin-based film institution, namely the German Cinematique, 
which was founded the same year and which had a focus on collecting and preserving film. Whereas the focus of the Friends was to present to screen films. Historically, and maybe nowadays again, uh, these are two antagonistic practices in a way. The first Osnar cinema opened in 1970. After the institution had moved in the year 2000, it now has two, uh, two cinema screens with an all year program. Since the first edition of the Berlinale Forum, which is one section of the Berlin Film Festival, the Friends of the German Cinematic, nowadays Arsenal, is the independent organizer of this festival section. In 2006, it was followed by the Forum Expanded. The yearly program of the Berlinale Forum was, and still is, very important for the in-house distribution arm. Many of the forum films were subtitled for the festival with the aim to keep the film prints available for cinemas and cinema clubs in speaking to, uh, German territories beyond the festival period. They form quite an important part of the collection. The archive also grew through the programming of the Arsenal Cinema and through specific curatorial interests of different people and relationships to filmmakers worldwide. There was never one specific policy in what may enter the archive. I don't know, uh, I don't go into details about the film collection, but would like to highlight the fact that the archive is mainly international, plus that it is up to 95% a print archive. These facts become relevant when we talk about the definition of an archive, plus its entanglement in national concepts. Many times film archives have the distinct function to preserve the national film heritage. So when it comes to funding for archive work, the production country becomes a relevant issue, at least in Germany. Now, I hope that I can share my screen with you. Um, so, around two seven, uh, 2007 or 2008, our film database went online. It became, a necess uh, it became necessary to make the collection accessible for researchers due to the fact that academics and artists from outside the institution discovered film prints in the archive that appeared to be the only surviving element of a film. This knowledge changed the perspective on the film collection, not in the sense of the value of it, but in terms of the responsibility that comes along with this knowledge of keeping the last element of a film, even if it is a film print. Since Arsenal doesn't receive funding for preservation activities, archival projects were initiated that combine research and digitization. The major project in that series was Living Archive, archive work as a contemporary artistic and curatorial practice, which involved 30 people from different uh, dif disciplines and backgrounds. They were invited to do research in the archive and to develop projects based on the film holdings. Outstanding here is the project of the Portuguese artist Filipa Cesa. At the time, she was searching for an institutional support to digitize the film holdings of the National Film Archive of Guinea-Bissau, which was in a very precarious state of decay. With funding from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we were able to ship the film materials to Berlin, to digitize them and return them afterwards in its analog and digital format. Since then, Philippa and the filmmakers from Guinea-Bissau, some of them still live, and there's also a new generation of young filmmakers. They develop different projects and strategies to make this archive material accessible again. Shortly after and based on this project, we were approached by a filmmaker and a journalist about the private collection of the Sudanese film director, Chadala Gubara. It became the second project of this kind, and again we received support from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The project structure was the same. The materials were shipped to Berlin, prepared and scanned, 
and return afterwards to Sudan. Based on these projects, we were approached by the Goethe Institute in Lagos to help them evaluating the condition of film materials that they came across by accident and to think about what can be done. In 2015-16, the film critic and co-founder of the Lagos Film Society, Didi Cheka, together with the Goethe Institute, were searching for a cinema space, and they came across the former colonial film unit in Lagos. This picture shows the main building, which has a cinema space inside. The building belongs nowadays to the Nigerian Film Corporation, which is the film department of the Ministry for, for Information and Culture. This picture shows the building in the backyard, which was part of the film processing lab at the time. In the first floor, they found two rooms filled with rusty film cans, which were exposed to the coastal climate of Lagos for many years. High humidity and high temperature. The smell indicates an immense level of vinegar, which is more or less evident just by looking at this picture. What we learned later is that this is just a small amount of the entire collection of the National Film Video and Sound Archive, the National Film Archive of Nigeria. The archive, which is also full mem a member of the FIAF, is a subdivision of the Nigerian Film Corporation. Due to the climate conditions in Lagos, the main part of the archive holdings were moved to Chos in central Nigeria at the beginning of the 90s. And for some reasons, some film cans remained in Lagos. Didi Cheka had a specific interest in those film materials since they date back uh, to the post-colonial times and may also contain footage filmed, for instance, during the Biafra War. Besides, it is about an almost unknown part of the Nigerian film history, which primarily is told from the 90s onward with the beginning of the so-called Nollywood productions. In 2016, um, the Goethe Institute invited uh, Stephanie Schulte-Strathaus, um, also here in the picture, she's uh, co-director of the Arsenal, and me to Lagos uh, to visit the premises and to gain an overview about the condition of the film materials. The basic qu question was if all the materials were forever lost or if parts could be rescued. We had some basic equipment with us to unwind and inspect footage, but in the beginning it was quite a challenge to even open the can. We had two guards from the Nigerian Film Corporation at our site carefully observing all our steps and restricting our doing. Besides, it was very difficult to operate in the given dusty surrounding and not to damage any further the films, but we weren't allowed to move the reel somewhere else. We tried to unwind just the first layers and check the condition and identify with mobile lights the image content to make some notes. This ended up in a collective process, everybody being involved to identify what's on the picture. Even the guards from the NFC, who at first were very suspicious about what we were doing, got enthusiastic about looking and deciphering the image content. It is this experience when people realize the content within a can and when they start to relate to it. At one point, Didi was reading the title Shea Uma on one of the film cans and said, this is very interesting. Shea Uma is a very well-known film, but it is considered lost since a long time. All reads that could be found of the film that day looked more or less like this one on the picture. Reels of positive prints that were totally deteriorated by the vinegar syndrome. Since the finding of Shia Umar caused such a stir, through the Goethe Institute, it was possible to arrange a meeting at the National Film Archive in Chos on short notice where we traveled the next day. This picture shows uh, the permanent site of the National Film and Video Sound Archive. In the front, uh, it's the administrative building and in the back, um, the film archive. 
Together with the head of the archive, Esther Jamila Turkuma, we were allowed to search for further elements of Sheuma. That day, and in a very short time, we were able to find further reels, among them also some negatives. The search was a bit difficult since the holdings weren't ordered by title and elements. In the past, they had a leak in the roof and water entered the archive. All cans had to be moved very quickly and the previous order got lost. The director of the NFC at the time wasn't interested in film preservation at all. There was not even money to get the generator running for electricity so that the archive staff members were unable to do their work. But in a meeting with him, it was possible to convince, to convince him of the importance of the film Sheo Uma and that we are interested in collaborating with them on whatever is possible to rescue of the film. At the end of this first trip, we were sitting together with Didi, who knows the institu institutional structures very well, and who had a clear aim in rescuing this part of the Nigerian film heritage to discuss options that may help to build a foundation for the preservation of the archive holdings. In the first step, we would ship all the cans that we found of Shia Uma to Berlin and check if a digitization is possible. Or in case it's impossible and the film remains incomplete, to think of other ways to work with the incompleteness of this work. Second, to make a presentation around the film at the Berlinale Forum or Forum Expanded. Such a presentation helps to create a public discussion around the archival situation which can also create an awareness on a political level, which in this case, uh, it is uh, very important. important. Third, um, the situation in trust was very different from Guinea-Bissau and Sudan. Considering the amount of films at their walls, plus the fact that they have an institutional infrastructure, the resources and archive staff led to the idea to write a funding application to install a scanner at the film archive and to conduct trainings in the fields of archiving and preservation. Mm. So now first um, about the restoration of Shia Uma. The inspection of the views that were shipped to Berlin created a mixture of frustration and hope at the same time. There was a wide variety of different materials. This one is a 35 millimeter positive reel of a distribution print with subtitles. Almost all the 35 millimeter positive print reels look the same in varying forms of deformation. Here we have a 60 millimeter distribution print. These reels were still in a wet state of decay and with, when I say still, um, I see there more hope than in the real before. Plus a few 35 millimeter negatives that were in a very good state. Interesting about this can is the label, indicating that the film was edited in 35 millimeter in A and B rolls, uh, which Paula explained before, uh, before in her talk. And uh, this kind of production on 35 millimeter also points to it, um, the fact that it was a big production. Plus that these negatives were inspected in 2006 by Nordisk Film in Norway. After some research, research, it turned out that there was the attempt for a collaboration on film preservation between Nigeria and Norway in the early 2000s. According to the colleagues in Norway, the collaboration didn't reach far and all the elements were returned to Nigeria at some point. This raised the hope for more cans in the archive in Chos. A further search at the archive was impossible without being there. Until we had the chance to return to Chos, we made some tests with the decaying reels. Re- and dehydration treatments were done at Limacini Retrovata in Bologna, which is a lab um, um, specialized on film restoration. And afterwards we did some scan tests in Berlin. 
This image shows one of the very wet 60 millimeter views, a print that totally uh, faded to yellow. And the little contrast and color left just leaves a slight trace of the image. This is the only 35 millimeter positive view that was uh, still in a treatable uh, state, uh, still more uh, information um, in the image. During the forum expanded panel day, think film number, two, uh, number five in 2017, Didi Cheka made a presentation that focused on film heritage as an essential part of the collective memory and the role of archives. I quote in parts, it's one thing when war causes the destruction of memory, but there's a hidden war when memory dies through a more or less conscious forgetting. What is the value of having a film archive and what use could there be for it? What is involved in getting access to this film archive? What institutional and infrastructural arrangement would support a film archive? I quote this since these questions are essential, even though they seem simple and evident. And in this particular case, posed in the context of an existing, but at the time not actively operating, but deteriorating archive. Due to the decision of officials, since they had not seen any value in those rusty cans or who may want to hide its content. Important is also the question of who is asking. In this case, Didi Cheka. Since the discovery of the film cans in Lagos, he calls himself an archivist by accident. And he is a driving force from outside the institutional framework with a personal interest in making this, uh, this archive accessible. We returned to Trust Mid of 2017. Within three hours and many helping hands, we went through every shelf and can, ending up with around 60 film cans of Sheo Uma, the original camera negative, tube negatives, and the optical sound negative, including also one positive reel that wasn't color faded and which gave a lead of the film's aesthetic. The film was completed and we could finish the digital restoration for the Berlinale in 2018. The film is based on the novel with the same name by Abu Bakar Tafawa Baleba, who was the first prime minister of Nigeria from 1957 until 66. He wrote a book in the early 30s as part of a literary contest set up by the colonial administrator of Northern Nigeria that should serve to promote literacy in the Hausa language. In his text, What Has, what has Happened to Nigeria's Post-War Cinema, Didi Cheka writes, Halilu's film deals with slavery in the Trans-Saharan trade route and the mother's undying love. Sold into slavery, Umar rose to scholarly prowess and earned the title of Shiwu. But one night, a dream about his mother, alone and wandering the desert, triggers his memory of her and his lost homeland. The quote continues, widely regarded as the first piece of Hausa literature, Shiwu Umar positions Islam as a benign force in the region with its participation in slavery incidental. There is, in this treatment, the possibility of approaching this film as propaganda of particular interest, especially to a classical Muslim community rather than to the general audience. There is a different context within which to view this film, however, not as an embarrassingly direct piece of propaganda. As a landmark in Nigeria's pre-Nollywood filmmaking, Shio Umar extends insight into the practice and method of films made in an earlier era that ended in the late 80s. The film was commissioned as Nigeria's official entry for the cinema strand of the Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, FESTA, held in Lagos in January and February 1977. Afterwards, it wasn't commercially distributed and sustained only a phantom existence in film cultural memory 
and occasional written records. This last passage is a quote uh, from the text A Film's Several Lives, which was written by Erika Carter for the DVD uh, that was published in 2019. In 2017, the Nigerian Film Corporation got a new director, Dr. Chidia Madueque. Even though he has no background in film at all, he got very passionate about the film archive and supports a lot of activities. In that year, we received the funding from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs to install a film scanner at the archive in Schoss and were able to conduct a first training. I don't go into details about the structural changes and adjustments that a digitization workflow means for an institution, nor the implications of a second digital archive. There's still a lot to build up in terms of infrastructure, but the film scanner became a central piece to consolidate the archival work. Last year in September, there was the press conference on the occasion of the inauguration of the first master's program in film culture and archival studies in Africa. The master's program is a collaboration between the University of Chos and the National Film Institute, which is a training, training arm of the NFC. The CHOS program was established with support from the DAD. In English, it is the uh, German Academic uh, Exchange Service, I would say. And in collaboration with uh, the Goethe University in Frankfurt, the DFF, Deutsches Film Institute, the Film Institute and uh, Film Museum in Frankfurt, uh, the Arsenal and the Lagos Film Society. It aims at training a new generation of students from within and outside of Nigeria to secure and make accessible for audiences and researchers the audiovisual heritage. Shortly after the inauguration, we attended the first Berlin Lagos Archival Film Festival. The second edition of the festival was supposed to take place in Berlin in September this year, but was postponed to June next year due to the coronavirus. Didi Cheka set up also a second edition of the Lagos Film Festival around the UNESCO or the Visual Heritage Day this week, which had to be canceled last minute due to violent conflicts in Lagos. I would like to end with this picture. Um, in December last year, I conducted a second training in Schoss together with Eckbert Koppe, who was head of the restoration department at the Bundesarchiv, which is the federal film archive uh, in Germany. During the workshop, he suggested that every student's student picks a can from the archive, which will then be used in a session on film identification. This moment on the picture, each student carrying a film can out of the walls made me remember the first encounter with the two rooms in Lagos being observed by the guards from the NFC, who were suspicious at first about us moving a film can out of the one room and the attempt to open it. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Marcus. Thank you very much, Marcus. Does anyone have a question that you want to share? Mientras, eh, in the meantime, I will ask a question. As you dare ask your own questions, I will say it in Spanish. I know it will be translated. I was curious, Marcus, to know what was the biggest challenge in this series of obstacles and challenges that you faced. Um, there are so many challenges <laughs> on different levels. Uh, I think the one challenge hasta que pudieron... ah. so I think there was an overlap with the translation okay um, um, so uh, as I said there were many challenges the one uh, which I uh, mentioned was um, uh, a lot of uh, institutions uh, there are uh, run by uh, politicians uh, this in the first place so for them, it is, um, and I think I can say that so openly, um, it is, um, um, then 
needs to be a need for them, something why they should do, why they should give you access to something um, when they don't believe in film preservation. Um, second, and maybe this is um, even more fundamental, uh, it took me also some time to understand it, uh, that, I mean, in Germany we have um, uh, images, moving images, still images from throughout the 19th century, dating back to the 18th century. In Nigeria, there is in fact no evidence, there is not such a, a culture of, um, of memory, nor the presence of, of pictures of this time. So first of all, to make people understand what is the value of these uh, images uh, for us nowadays, for, um, for a new generation is, um, was also one uh, basic challenge to, uh, to transmit. But um, this is uh, for me always uh, very important to point out um, in such a um, project that um, Didi was always the driving force. So it was mainly possible, first of all, for us to understand through him what is the situation in Nigeria, but also having him in between to negotiate between the institutions. And then uh, last, um, also what I mentioned is, um, in fact, the, uh, the Nigerian Film, um, uh, Film Corporation and uh, the Film Archive, they exist as such, but they were inactive uh, for a long time. For instance, they have, uh, if when you go to the old film lab in Chos, this is incredible what you find there in terms of printers and developing machines, but they are standing still since many years. So in fact, you have uh, great staff members uh, who also have a knowledge of uh, photochemical processing and printing, but they didn't practice since many years. So in fact, what they did is uh, they came to work, sitting down, having breakfast, discussing, sleeping, and then going back home. So, um, if we imagine that you know now we are coming and saying, okay, let's rescue this archive. They look at you, <laughs> they say like, okay, what do you want from me? <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you break into a rhythm that is uh, with your optimism and your enthusiasm. Uh, and you kind of face a lot of uh, many walls. And, Another challenge is, and this is why this uh, project in particular got so important to me, that it also helped me to reflect a lot on um, the, the situation we have within our institution, because it's something you, you know, you grow into, you get to know the archive, how it works, you get to, sit, uh, to know the situation of funding and how you deal with national or international film heritage, um, all these kinds. But this exchange with the archive in Tross um, was something very different to think again from in a way a point zero and to start off how to how to implement a workflow in this situation and not saying like okay we do it like this and so you have to do it it is first of all to understand what is there what is the given uh, infrastructure and from there to develop something that applies to this institution. So um, I hope I could give um, some levels of, um, of challenges, but um, also um, aspects that I find um, very productive for my own work, not only in relation to the archive there, but also here, what we do at Arsenal. Gracias. Thank you. I don't know if you can now hear me properly because I have some uh, problems with my connections, but I wanted to underline that it's very important what you were mentioning regarding the challenge of finding obstacles that come from institutions and people that do not believe that it's important to preserve films and how these activities 
and the diffusion of these materials can generate that people and youth are more and more engaged and involved and sharing this idea of the relevance of preservation and of these materials in a way so that we put some pressure or this is a hidden force that emerges for the things that should be done that could help in the rescuing of these materials to be a part of the solution. So I think this is a good example of all that. Um, I always feel like that uh, really when you um, show people rusty film cans, um, I focus on rusty because it makes everything so old and unusable and uh, so uh, throw it away. You even have, I mean, even the question is there, why did you keep it that long? If you don't believe in it, what do you do with it? Why do you install an archive that in fact is not in use? That is something else. It's when, it's really the moment, uh, I remember a meeting um, with, uh, it was at the ministry in Abuja, and you talk and everybody's listening to you and you feel like, okay, in the next moment they're gonna sleep. But uh, then we showed just some uh, scan samples of Shia Uma. And suddenly you could see in all these boyish eyes that something appeared which they could relate to. Because in fact, in, in this case, um, Shia Uma, it is something that they know. It was a book that was also taught in school. So suddenly they have, you know, there is an image and they can see what it's there. Or um, there, uh, the NFC also runs a festival in Abuja, which is uh, called the Suma Film Festival. And they dedicated two years ago, a program um, to, um, to the archive work. And um, during a workshop, uh, during the first workshop, uh, we scanned, um, just a small piece of Cockro at Dawn, which was a very uh, famous series in Nigeria in the 70s, 80s. So Didi Chika in his presentation used this small clip, the intro, where there's also the, uh, the music. And it was incredible, incredible. The, everybody in the hall jumped up from the chair and started to sing with this song of the series. And in that moment, you realize that there is a real affection to um, when you see images and that, that this is the moment where you can get people and even the most cranky politician, I would say, to, um, to relate to something that in the first place was totally um, distant for, for him. Yes. yes. I believe that this work, I don't know if to call it work, but these cases of people who are there checking and restoring, they have a lot of times that are disappointing and negative. From the beginning, you are faced to situations that are beyond repair, a lot of work to do that is uh, very difficult to get done, but you also find these moments, as you were mentioning, finally, someone can access these images, the films reach certain audiences, and it's really gratifying to have done all the works and to have gone through all the hurdles that you find along the road. These good moments beat all the bad moments because all of us who work in this find it so because when the people that work in this field grow and grow and share the relevance of this kind of work you always find more obstacles than joy and sometimes these moments of joy uh, even up you know make it even for all the moments of despair and I think it's important on one side this stage, which is usually the final stage to make uh, these materials visible for other people. This is the result of a lot of work. And in this way, you can 
uh, spread the word and create awareness about this. I don't know if there is another question from the audience. I had uh, uh, questions about the rest of the materials that you found there. What happened to, to those materials? Many of those, I figure, are, were incomplete films, and many were in uh, highly decomposed, so you couldn't do much about them. But I wondered what happened with that collection. Well, first of all, uh, the process is uh, slowly uh, um, advancing. Um, the um, uh, let's say uh, from for instance from the uh, film cans uh, that were stored in uh, Lagos, which nowadays uh, I think it was end of last year, they were finally transported uh, all together to Chos. It was uh, very interesting to uh, inspect um, or to see that, for instance, a black and white negative from the fifties was, I, I, if I say it was in a brilliant condition, <laughs> I say it in comparison to the very lost vinegar prints. But in fact, you can, we did also some scan tests of this material, like the building of the Lagos Bridge, um, which is really, it's, it's very, it's comparably in a very good state. Whereas if you deal with the print, um, the color print materials from the 70s, 80s, and I think Paula was also referring th to that before, it's, uh, it's another story. It's uh, sometimes uh, really you can't use them anymore. They're so deteriorated. Um, so like um, within the process of, um, uh, uh, when we prepared this uh, installment of the scanner, we also made suggestions um, to the archive uh, what is necessary to be done. Like in the first step, um, because all the archive was in uh, disorder, they had to order it again to gain an overview. Okay, what is what do we have of which title? Because. For instance, they started um, of uh, they started with the um, digitization of one other feature film of uh, Adam Muhalido, which is co uh, called uh, Kulba Nabana. And the question is then to say, okay, what do we have of it? If you don't have the archive ordered, we don't know where to find what and if it's incomplete or not. The same situation which with which we were dealing. So this is uh, the main thing they are um, uh, still focusing on. And then at the same time, it is um, oh, what is quite a challenge there is the vinegar syndrome in itself, because um, <clears throat> there is uh, this kind of thinking that um, you get sick of when you work in a room of vinegar. Which is also true if uh, true if the uh, concentration is very high, uh, then I mean I myself I get a headache, but up to a certain level it's not a problem. So there are many different levels uh, still to negotiate with, until let's say you know the archive staff members just go into the archive and order the shelves. They open the can. They say like okay oh this is really bad, and to think of also they have one big room, uh, but not a separate room where, for instance, they can put all the heavy decayed materials. So um, like last year in this uh, training with uh, Egbert Koppe, we did, we kept on suggesting, uh, suggesting what to do, um, uh, how to order and what steps uh, to approach next. Then, um, so with uh, this one title I mentioned, and they uh, started to digitize it, then we make some exchanges, they send material, and then I look at it and say like, okay, maybe here or maybe there to help to assist them in proceeding. Because um, another big issue will be now, um, what to do with all the digital data. So uh, I mentioned it before, uh, a film scanner uh, many times is, I mean, for this project, it was essential. 
uh, to advance. But at the same time, um, many people see the film scanner as the solution uh, to everything. But your, the real problem starts once you have a film scanner, because you have to think of, okay, I mean, if you can't preserve your analog uh, film holdings, how will you start to preserve uh, and then to migrate again the digital data in the future? I mean, you can build up a shelf full of hard drives, but you know the implication this has on the institution is on is again very tough. So what we try to do is also um, this um, archival study program, uh, which I was mentioning includes uh, the exchange of staff members. So um, um, people from uh, Arsenal and from the DFF in Frankfurt, they go to teach in, um, in uh, CHOS, in reverse archive staff members and uh, university uh, people, uh, academics, uh, go to Frankfurt and Berlin to get trained here. Uh, again, it is about to, uh, to discuss all the different aspects to show them how we implement the work in our institution and with having in mind what the situation is there and to think of what may be a solution for them. So I feel like at the moment, because it is um, when we started the project and the archive was inactive, it is now that we have to work at so many levels at a time and this in parallel to negotiate between, okay, uh, analog film, digital uh, digitization and digital preservation and um, building up the knowledge in uh, all the different areas and fields. I think the answer was longer than the question. Sorry. <laughs> sí, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And yes, we do share our passion and our fear for everything that digitalization and manipulation and the storing of the material implies when they are digitized and those that are born digital as well. Uh, we have that same problem here at the Film Museum. It's a large door that we didn't dare open yet but it would be great to be able to do so. I don't know if there is any other questions. Ari had one question. Well, I have this quotation that Paula brought that I liked it a lot. I have it in my background image. And my question was because, well, when talking about this proposal and the need that preservers found to foster interdisciplinary crossing that Paula mentioned in her presentation to articulate the participation of the artists, the restorers, the researchers. I was interested in maybe bringing two topics to see if we can discuss about that. One in the in connection to the set of objects that are a result of the preservation process. And in that regard, I am interested in the idea of having film in paper or film in other media and the power that an object can have to have and express an idea of film expanding maybe the film that you're working with. And on the other side, I think that all of these projects that you are describing express themselves in a post-disciplinary stage. I was thinking what other crossroads you think are interesting to think about in this preservation landscapes besides the ones that you mentioned. I thought that what Mark told about collective processes of activation of the materials were very interesting with the students, with different figures. What do you think about all this? I don't know if this... I can start if you want and then... Uh, sorry, Marcus, but something that I was thinking when Marcus was talking about the African project and something that, yes, really is leaves a mark. As I wrote my thesis about experimental film, I had a colleague in the master's degree that wrote about Ghana and very similar to what Marcus described in Nigeria, what they did in Ghana, 
current farmhouse and then Ana Jimenez, was this first question of how to go through this situation when someone does not believe in the value of memory or the value of audiovisual materials for the construction of memory. In that regard, and to re answer your question, Ari, what other kinds of knowledge? Well, photographers uh, as well. I don't think there is any preservation work that is finished without an audience, as film or art does not exist without the experience of contemplation, of consumption, of interaction, the experience, right, of the artwork. No preservation work is finished without a connection with an audience, without what that generates in the audience. As Marcus told about people singing after seeing this fragment, is something that happened to us many times. For example, in the screenings that we have of advertising films, which are activations of archive that generate a reaction that is very experiential. People sometimes uh, start singing or remember. And advertisements, besides the marketing side, they have something about daily consumption. It's something very familiar to everyone. So it immediately activates memories that have to do with families, with home, with culture, or times, or smells, or tastes. And it also happens when we do the home film day. I think something very important to get out of the standards and especially those of uh, cataloging and documenting the possibility to get these images closer, not only to, in our case, uh, or news to historians that can tell you who that is, what happened there, what is this news they're talking about, to move these images or to bring these images closer to an audience that can help us document which were their experiences. What is it that these images activate in the community that many times are not within the standards, the date, the name, many other things that show up at the time in which the image is shown that are still not much part of preservation, but I think that they should be part of it. I don't know if I answer to, the, to your question. Uh, uh, Marcus? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would um, like to uh, relate to what uh, Paula said, because <clears throat> uh, lately um, uh, th this was uh, one uh, inauguration speech uh, for the fear of Congress. And uh, I have to say, I have to re-listen to it because I stumbled upon something which uh, I'm still not sure if he meant it this way. And it was, uh, I mean, we all know, okay, um, there is much more film material in the world and we won't be able to rescue everything. Um, so what is now your position toward it? How do you prior, uh, prioritize uh, for what do we decide? What do we preserve? And uh, this one point was, okay, uh, someone has to make decisions and um, also um, we shouldn't attempt to preserve, to digitize everything because our future generations will hate us for it because we overwhelm them with uh, too much and uh, too much material and material nobody has decided before what is important. And I, I don't quote me ever, <laughs> like I said, it's, um, it was a free, um, uh, interpretation I got uh, out of it and I have to get back to it uh, again. But uh, I know this position, uh, which is, uh, I would say, especially um, uh, um, active in, let's say, uh, classic institutional archives. 
the thing is, and uh, I would say uh, Shia Umar is uh, one of the best examples for it. I mean, we started this restoration out of nothing. I mean, it was a great risk at the time to say like, oh yeah, <laughs> let's digitize a film nobody knows about, in fact, how it is, how it's aesthetic, uh, and if it's of value. Um, but the importance and also contemporary uh, importance of the film. If you think about uh, the subject of it, of the Trans-Saharan slave trade, whereas oh, but, uh, everybody's talking of, about the transatlantic slave trade. So once you t see that film from a nowadays perspective, it's so contemporary uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the subject of migration, just to give one example. So what I'm trying to aim for is, we are not the ones to decide what is of value and if this may be of value or not in, in future times. Our aim is to, um, for me, um, or let's say at, um, at Arsenal, we try to have um, as many voices as possible to think of uh, what needs to be preserved or what can we do, because there can't be just one point, uh, one person to decide on and make this decision. There needs to be many and the attempt should be to rescue and preserve as much as possible and to overwhelm eventually or probably our future generations with it, but they will find their way through it. Yes, I was also thinking that the intention of promoters and producers facing restorations also includes more and more, at least we try to do that, to include the audience. As Paula said, to expand this for people that maybe is not related directly to the production, but with the consumption of these films in this case how important it is also sometimes to have information about what was seen, how it was seen. There are a lot of experiences about how the activity of going to the cinema was, was very different to, for instance, how I went to the cinema or how Paula went to the cinema and how people go to the cinema today. The way to consume films in the different periods of history also gives us information about what is relevant. I think it can help us to know what is important to preserve and restore, not only the information about the film, but also this idea of also keeping a record of how it was at the time to watch films. It's like another arm, if you want, of how to preserve the cinematographic experience that, again, comes back through the material. It's also important to know how it was consumed at the time, but that can also help in the process that Paula said of really focusing in the artist, in the work of art. I think it's also important to know how it was received. And regarding the materials, we also have this idea of crossing different areas, different types of knowledge. There are very concrete examples and different elements. We're facing the absence of filmic material. We have replaced this with others, I don't know, clippings from the newspaper to somehow move closer to this final work that we're trying to restore. So photos or clippings or texts can help. I think it's very important, as Paula said, it's a type of work that uh, as many voices are gathered, the closer it will be to manage this correct restoration. If that term is possible, actually. 
Thank you. I don't know if there is any other question. No. Uh, maybe just to uh, relate what you said, um, because this was nice on the, uh, um, um, uh, the one sheet uh, Paula showed at the beginning, which was also mentioning uh, the documentation, because I mean, this is also something when we work in uh, digitization or restoration, that in fact, we have to be aware of the fact that also we uh, make decisions um, that somebody else could do, could decide something else. So um, if I wouldn't, for instance, document at the end what has been done during the process, somebody believes, okay, this is how it should be. But in fact, you know, there's always a fluidity of, uh, or uh, possibilities of making things different, even though we try to stick as much as possible to what we've seen. I mean, the uh, again, Shea Uma, I had one reel of, uh, of um, uh, 35 millimeter, which I believe is uh, true in terms of colors and it was uh, remained in a good state. But still, I don't know, the other prints that are lost may have looked differently and the director is not alive anymore, nor could we retrace the cinematographer and all this. So um, I'm relying, in fact, on one reel uh, of a print. Uh, and this is, um, yeah, um, there is no evidence how it looked at the time in, uh, in Nigeria, I don't know, in, uh, when, the, when it premiered in Lagos. I could contribute something else. I was thinking recently, or just now, actually, on one side, when Adi was talking about the other documents, you can think about uh, creating an expanded work. You can include, in the case of Horizons, these cards, the script, the still photos, the handouts, and also sometimes precisely to mix this in with the connection with the audience and the way to generate, uh, to raise awareness, to gain access. Some things are arbitrary sometimes and sometimes a bit crazy. I wanted to give the example that, uh, well, in the museum we restored recently the first film that had sound in Argentina, which is called Muñequitas Porteñas from 1929, that was made with the synchronized sound system. Very big uh, vinyl records, and the museum has or had or has the original negative. It's incomplete, but it's beautiful. But we do not have the discs, uh, the vinyls. So discussing with Andre, with Leandro. The idea is that we couldn't stop showing this film, which is so important for the history of Argentine film, that is in all of the books, but nobody has seen because it was not there, because it didn't exist. But to show it uh, silent could be an experience for researchers, but to show it for an audience, we needed to find a strategy and so what we thought about for one screening that we did in the film festival of the city was to ask uh, a playwright and a director, Santiago Losa and Ariel, I forgot his last name, Leandro, help me. And they wrote a script on what they saw, based on what they saw in the film. But it was not sticking so necessarily so much to the film. And on top of it, that script was read live by actors with a company of music created specifically for that projections. In terms of restoration, this is basically a performance based or supported in 
the film, but what it implied uh, in terms of audience, a lot of people saw the film that wouldn't have done this in another way. So I th we thought it was a valid way. Uh, of, of course, if you're specifying that this was something that you added to the experience, that it didn't belong to the original film, but everybody talked about the film again, about Ferreira, the director, and this allowed us to bring it closer to the audience in an unconventional way, but more effective than if we had only shown an incomplete copy, a silent incomplete copy of a film that should have never been seen in that way. So um, what I mean is it also in this, and it's inventive, creative, when you think about how to rescue a film. A fragment of this film that was mainly done from a 35 millimeter copy live was seen inside um, the film, a small scene. Ariel Gurevich was the name that uh, wrote the script with Santiago Losa, this kind of script that they uh, for Muñequita Porteña. There's a question from Lucia for Marcus. It's asking if Arsenal is involved in restoration projects in Argentina like it did in Nigeria. Let me start by answering that not in Argentina, but there's a film by an Argentine director. They did a large work that Marcus did, what was uh, one film by Birri. Technically, it's not an Argentinian film, and maybe one Uruguayan film, I know, but he should answer this. Well, uh, the film you referred to is Org, uh, which Fernando Birri uh, produced from 1967 until 1977 uh, in Rome, um, um, which is, uh, I would say um, a must uh, to know experimental film uh, because what they did in this uh, 10 year production period is really incredible. And um, it was um, by accident, um, some researchers stumbled upon this film, uh, film print, which is three hours long. Uh, if I start with it, <laughs> We won't end um, then. So um, to keep it short, it's a must to see, but there's also um, a print in, uh, now help me, what's the film institution in Buenos Aires? Um, because they also worked on, um, on uh, a restoration of Biri's film, films, and they included also this, um, um, our digitization in the film. Uh, in the DVD, ah, the net. Oh. Well, maybe no, it comes back to my no. mind. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know if it has been published uh, yet or if it will be published, but it's really a must to see, uh, even though he was in exile at the time. Um, so others in Argentina know uh, we had uh, lately we finished two films by short films by Mario Handler from Uruguay, Me uh, gustan los estudiantes and Liberarse, uh, Liberarse. And the year before, for instance, uh, we did now two films by Marta Rodriguez and Jorge Silva from uh, Colombia. Um, the one was uh, Chicales and the other is uh, Nuestra Voz de Tierra, Memoria y Futuro. So all of these films um, are part of the collection because or uh, they were shown at the forum at the time or uh, because um, maybe for film historians, he's, uh, you're familiar with him, Peter B. Schumann and Heiner Ross, who were at the time working for Arsenal and also curating a lot, um, they, um, they brought a lot of uh, Latin American, especially also experimental and militant cinema uh, with them to, um, uh, to the collection. 
So yes, um, now and then um, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm glad to work uh, also with Latin American cinema because it's uh, through uh, also my say in Buenos Aires um, 10 years ago, I hope to return one day maybe with a new project. So uh, also when you, Leandro, uh, when you were at uh, Arsenal, we came across uh, this one from Ocurido and Walfin, Walfin um, by Remuno Gleiser. Uh, which I'm still eager to know about <laughs> what version we do have here. <laughs> so, uh, I think we can have already a project for <laughs> next year, maybe next coming years. Yes. So if there are, uh, and um, uh, this is uh, the main challenge uh, usually uh, to get the funding for the projects. And um, because we can't access the fundings for film preservation from uh, German, fun um, uh, the regular German uh, funding, because these are not German productions, it always needs, we need to find other ways uh, to make it happen. But there are ways uh, also with, um, uh, with the Goethe Institute, we did a lot of projects uh, in India in um, South Africa, with, uh, without the help, it wouldn't have been possible to publish uh, the films also in DVD. So there are, uh, yes, it's spread it. Well, perfect. I think our time is up. So I thank you all very much, everyone who was listening and participating, and of course, mainly Marcus, Paula, and Ari. Um, I don't know if you want to make a goodbye comment. Do you have the opportunity? Well, I wanted to greet everyone. I wanted to thank everybody. I wanted to say to greet Inge, uh, just a black uh, square in uh, the screen and the sign of a microphone. But also I wanted to say hi to you and thank you to everyone who took part of it. Well, also on the behalf of the Biennial, I wanted to thank Inge and the Goethe Institute and also thank Paula Marcus and Leandro for the round table and thank you Alejo for translating. But here's also from my side, thank you very much for the translation <laughs> and uh, all in all uh, for the invitation to take part in this uh, because it came as a surprise and it was a uh, very interesting uh, round. Thank you very much. Bueno, les well, we uh, expect you in other activities. They continue this afternoon with a table which is called What to Do Festivals and Curators. Artists are going to participate as well. And uh, at 7 p.m., we have the fourth session of collective image making devoted to family movies. So we will be projecting this home movies. Everybody is invited to open your archives and show your films in your Zoom windows. Thank you, everybody, so much. And let's see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>